platypus genome. Uh, the platypus is an unusual organism, and uh, for a couple of uh, descriptions, I'm going to turn to Wikipedia and Natu National Geographic. First, Wikipedia. The unusual appearance of this egg-laying, duck-billed, beaver-tailed, otter-footed mammal baffled European naturalists when they first encountered it, with some considering it an elaborate hoax. <coughs> it is one of the few venomous mammals the male platypus having a spur on the hind foot that delivers a venom capable of causing severe pain to humans. The unique features of the platypus make it an important subject in the study of evolutionary biology. And uh, the National Geographic, the platypus is among nature's most unlikely animals. In fact, the first scientists to examine a specimen believed they were the victims of a hoax. The animal is best described as a hodgepodge of more of familiar species, the duck, bill and webbed feet, a beaver, tail, and otter, body and fur. Males are also venomous, like snakes. And as we'll find out, like snakes in terms of the kinds of genes that produce the venom. They have sharp stingers on the heels of their rear feet and can use them to deliver a strong toxic blow to any foe. There's the creature itself, one photo from uh, Australia. Uh, and the uh, website will appear later. Um, there's an article that just came out in Nature about, oh, 2008, and um, then made a splash and kind of disappeared. And I haven't commented on it yet, but I thought it, was, it would be an interesting article to look at. Uh, genome analysis of the platypus reveals unique signatures of evolution. Um, unique signatures is, um, uh, well, putting it mildly, shall we say. Um, there's a list of authors. Well, not quite. Actually, in a choreagendum in Nature, it said in this article, Mikhail Nedefov and Peter J. Dijon were omitted from the author list. Oops. <laughs> so, this has enough authors to keep one busy for a while. Um, <clears throat> the abstract reads, we present a, a draft genome sequence of the platypus. And there's the uh, Latin name. Um, and in case you're wondering, an ornitho is bird, and orinchus is beak. So that's the generic name. This monotreme exhibits a fascinating combination of reptilian and mammalian characters. For example, platypuses have a coat of fur adapted to an aquatic lifestyle. Platypus females lactate, give, make milk, yet lay eggs and males are equipped with venom similar to that of reptiles. Analysis of the first monotreme genome aligned these features with genetic innovations. We find that reptile and platypus venom proteins have been co-opted independently from the same gene families. Milk protein genes are conserved despite platypuses laying eggs. And Immune family uh, expansions are directly related to platypus biology. Expansions of protein, non-protein coding RNA, and microRNA families, as well as repeat elements, are identified. Sequencing of this genome now provides a valuable resource for deep mammalian comparative analysis, as well as for monitoring biology and conservation. And uh, so that's a kind of a general description. What you're going to find out is the platypus looks like it was sewed together from different animals, and many people thought it was a hoax when it first came out. Uh, they found specimens from Australia. Well, as it turns out, genetically, it's a hoax, except that it's not. It's real. The platypus 
has always elicited excitement and controversy in the zoological world. Some initially considered it to be a true mammal despite its duck bill and webbed feet. The platypus was placed with the echidnas in a new ta into a new taxon called the monotremata, meaning single hole because of their common external opening for urogenital and digestive systems. Traditionally, the monotremata are considered to belong to the mammalian subclass Prototheria. That just means first beasts, which diverged from the therapsid line that led to the theria, the actual beasts, and subs subsequently split into the marsupials, marsupiala, and eutherians, or true beasts, if you like, or placentalia. The divergence of the monotremes and the therians, the beasts, falls into the large gap in the amniote phylogeny between the eutherian radiation about 90 million years ago and the divergence of mammals from the sar saropsid line lineage around 315 million years ago in figure one, and we're going to see that in just a minute. Estimates of the monotreme theria divergence time range between 160 and 210 million years ago. Here we will use 166 million years ago, recently estimated from fossil and molecular data. And there's the standard uh, tree. Now this tree is uh, uh, missing quite a few things, uh, and I'll point a few of them out. You know, first of all, you'll notice that there are no beasts here. Now one could put some therapsids. Um, in primitive mammals, but um, they don't, they haven't done so. Um, mammals that are neither uh, eutheria nor marsupials, uh, but are definitely not monotremes, are a little more difficult to, to put there. That's, uh, so you, you know, a lot of this is um, kind of, I mean, amniotes, what does that tell you about the animal? Not much. And remember, these are supposed to be actual animals in evolutionary theory, not just placeholders. Um, cladism uh, really won't work unless you have something that keeps going, that produces these things. And then the uh, sauropsids and the diapsids, this, uh, snakes and lizards belong here. Eh, that's okay. Archaeosaurs include a whole bunch of things, including dinosaurs, and specifically the Tuatara, whose genome was partially sequenced after this article came out, so it's not surprising that they didn't try to deal with it, but um, uh, that's something that somebody should deal with eventually. Uh, we actually have DNA from something that is not a bird, that is supposed to be a dinosaur, if you please. Uh, and it would be very interesting to see whether the bird DNA that we'll find here actually is found in the dinosaur as well, or whether that's something special, in which case it looks like we may have some horizontal gene, gene transfer. And uh, one could argue that it really should be rather than just unassisted horizontal gene transfer, that it was in fact assisted, and in which case we may have a evidence for a designer. But moving on from there, the most extraordinarily and con extraordinary and controversial aspect of platypus biology was initially whether or not they lay eggs like birds and reptiles. In 1884, Will William Caldwell's concise telegram to the British Association announced Monotremes oviparous, monum, uh, ovum meroblastic, not holoblastic as in other mammalian uh, the other two mammalian groups. And I should probably explain to you. Well, oviparous simply means they lay eggs, and meroblastic means that when the cell division happens, the yolk doesn't divide very fast, and so you have a whole bunch of little cells at the top in this one big cell or two big cells at the bottom. Um, and the yolk stays within those cells. Um, 
And so it's kind of a feature of, if you lay eggs, it's pretty hard to, to do a holoblastic division because it means that you're going to have to divide that yolk up all the time. Um, the egg is laid in an earthen nesting burrow after about 21 days and hatches 11 days later. Interestingly enough, in a chicken, for example, the egg is laid after about one or two days and then hatches, uh, spends most of its time outside the mother uh, before it hatches. So monotremes, actually, the eggs stay in for a little while and uh, do a bunch of cell divisions and then finally are laid and then finish up the rest of the cell divisions and turn into a little tiny critter that is very, very small. Um, about the size, well, the eggs are about a centimeter in length, 11 millimeters more or less. And uh, so that's about two-fifths of an inch if you're in the English system. And um, uh, that means you have a very tiny uh, creature that crawls out of the egg and uh, uh, winds up having to be nursed for considerable time before it's ready to be out on its own. For about four months, when most organ systems differentiate, the young depend on milk sucked directly from the abdominal skin as females lap, lack nipples. They just put out the milk and the, and the little critters lap it up. Um, platypus milk changes in protein composition during lactation, as it does in marsupials, but not in most eutherians. The anatomy of the monotreme reproductive system reflects its reptilian origins, but shows features typical of mammals, as well as unique specialized characteristics. Well, it looks like reptiles anyway. Spermatozoa are filiform, like those of birds and reptiles, not like those of mammals, but uniquely among amniotes. Uh, that means this is different from all birds, reptiles, and everything form bundles of 100 during passage through the epididymis. They swim together. Chromosomes are arranged in def defined order in sperm as they are in therians, but not in birds. So here's one that's like birds. There's another one like it's in mammals. The testes synthesize testosterone and dihydrotestosterone as in therians, regular animals. But there is no scrotum, and testes are abdominal as it is in uh, reptiles and birds. That, the reason that's important is because in mammals in particular, if uh, the testes don't descend, um, they stay too warm. And the uh, animal be becomes sterile. Is also at risk for cancer of the testes. And that has clinical significance in people. But uh, 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 the, the only other mammals that I know of that have testes that don't descend um, are whales. And interestingly enough, they have an entire circulatory system that uh, uh, is designed to cool the testes by running the blood first through the tail fluke, where it gets to the temperature of the water around it, which is usually cool, and then uh, circulates back, um, actually does a little counter circulation with the arterial blood that's coming in directly into the testes, um, so that the uh, blood going to the testes eventually cools down. Um, so mammals don't do too well with inside, uh, inside testes, but the, uh, uh, the platypus does. Other special features of the platypus are its gastrointestinal system, neuroanatomy. It has a sixth sense. It can sense electricity uh, and a venom delivery system unique among mammals, but shared somewhat with snakes, as we'll see. Um, platypus is an obligate aquatic feeder that requires on its thick pelage, that's its pelt, and it used to be hunted for its pelt for what it's worth, you know, sort of like beavers, um, to maintain its low, lower than usual body temperature 
during fe feeding in icy, in often in icy water. So even though its temperature is low, it's not as low as uh, the water is around it, and so it has to stay warm, relatively warm. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, 32 degrees centigrade, um, um, 36 degrees centigrade is normal body temperature. Pardon me, 37 degrees. Um, and um, with its eyes, ears, and nostrils closed while foraging underwater, it uses an electrosensory system in the bill to lo help locate aquatic invertebrates and other prey. Interestingly, adult monotremes lack teeth. And in that, they're somewhat similar to anteaters. The platypus genome, as well as the animal, is an amalgam of ancestral reptilian and derived mammalian characteristics. That's kind of the bottom line for everything we're going to be talking about. Not only does the animal take from all kinds of different other animals and birds and reptiles, whatever, the, uh, the genome does as well. The platypus karyotype comprises 52 chromosomes in both sexes with a few large and many small chromosomes reminiscent of reptilian macro and micro chromosomes. More similar to reptiles than to regular animals, even though it's classified as a mammal. Platypuses have multiple sex chromosomes with an, some homology to the bird Z chromosome. And I'm sorry, I didn't. I missed putting a reference up there. Uh, males have five X and five Y chromosomes, which uh, form a chain at meiosis and segregate into five X and five Y sperm. Sex determination and sex chromosome dosage compensation remain unclear. So we won't obviously deal with that because they don't know either. Um, think of that. Instead of one X and one Y that you have to get into the proper cells when you're doing my, uh, meiosis, you have to make sure the five, all five X's go one way and all five Y's go the other way. Here we describe the platypus genome sequence and compare it to the genomes of other mammals and of the chicken. So they're comparing it to mammals and birds, although there will be some comparison with reptiles as well. Um, but it's spotty that way. It'll be interesting to redo this with a comparison with reptiles, and particularly with the tuatara. Uh, sequencing and assembly. Because there were no platypus, I'm not reading the whole thing. Uh, if you see uh, yellow dots, that means I'm skipping some areas. Um, because there were no platypus linkage maps available, we used fluorescent in situ hybridization to spot and to localize a subset of subsequent scaffolds to chromosomes following the greed nomenclature. So basically what they did was they made antibodies to st this particular DNA stretch, and then they saw where the, and uh, put fluorescent markers on them, and they saw where those markers went in terms of chromosomes, and that helped them to understand where this sequence goes in, uh, in the chromosomes of the, uh, uh, of the animal, the platypus. Of the 1.84 gigabytes uh, of assembled sequences, 437 megabyte, megabases were ordered and oriented along 20 of the platypus chromosomes. So they haven't got it all figured out yet. They're trying to figure out which ones go where, but they do know that at least these are the DNA sequences of part of the uh, part of the platypus chromosome. They're publishing before everything is known, which is not unusual anymore. Non-protein coding genes. In general, the platypus genome contains fewer computationally predicted non-protein coding genes, uh, non-protein coding RNAs, uh, 1,220 cases, excluded high repetitive, pardon me, I think that's excluding. That's the way they wrote it, uh, high repetitive small nuclear RNA, uh, or SNO RNA as they call it, small nuclear, nuclear RNA, 
um, copies, see below, than do other mammalian species. For example, humans with 4,421 instead of the 1,000 that we were looking at, similar to observation in chickens, where the chicken has 655. So it's closer to chicken than it is to human in that regard. This is probably because of the extensive retrotransposition of non-coding RNAs in theory in mammals and the apparent lack of L1-mediated retrotransposition in chickens and platypus. We have a L1, which is um, a, a line along uh, interspersed nuclear element, which is um, uh, can insert itself in different places in the in genomes, and apparently it hasn't done as much of it in platypuses and in chickens as it has done in humans. The exception to this is the platypus family of snow RNAs, which is markedly expanded. 2,000 matches to the RFAM covariant models compared to that for Therian mammals, which only has 200. Snow RNAs are involved in RNA modification, in particular in ribosomal RNA, and are often located in introns of protein coding genes. Our investigations revealed a novel short interspersed element sign like snow RNA re related retrotransposon, something that can take DNA and put it back into um, uh, put it back into a genome which we have labeled snow RTE, that is RNA-related transposons, SNORT for short. I'm sure they love that. That has duplicated in platypus to 40,000 full-length or truncated copies. So platypus DNA has a lot of repetitive DNA. What's the purpose of that? Is that something from the outside? We don't know. It is retrotransposed by means of retrotransposon-like uh, non-LTR uh, transposable elements as opposed to L1-mediated uh, transposition mechanism in therians. We constructed a complementary DNA library of small non-coding uh, RNAs and identified 321 consensus sequence of small RNAs that included 166 snow RNAs. 99 of these cloned snow RNAs are found in paralogous families, somewhat uh, analogous to each other. And 21 of them belong to the snow RNA RTE class. The presence of both the structural requirements known to be important in snow RNA function and evidence of their expression are consistent with these snow RTE elements being functional in the platypus. So they've got this stuff in there and it's repetitive and it has various functions that it can do whether they're good functions for the animal or not is in question and then they're going to go after some other RNA stuff and uh, this is a part that I think is particularly interesting similar to the other RNA unrelated uh, NCRNAs that have proliferated in therian mammals for example uh, the 7SL RNA-derived primate ALU elements, TNRNA-derived rodent identifier elements. This recent sign-like expansion is probably due to chance events. How do we know? However, given the RNA modification activity of snow RNAs and our increasing awareness of the cellular importance of RNA molecules, it might be that some of the retrotranspositionally duplicated RNAs were accepted into new functions in this species. What that means is that sometimes you can find functions for this stuff. But it's still due to chance. One's faith that, our, that uh, unguided evolution is uh, the truth is on display here. You find that it actually does something, but it can't have been planned, so it must have been luck. Other small RNAs. Overall, we found commonalities with small RNA pathways of other mammals, but also features that are unique to monotremes. 
Components of the RNA interference machinery are conserved in the platypus, including elements of biogenesis pathways and RNA interference effector complexes. Of 20, 20 million 924,000 platypus and echidna sRNA reads derived from liver, kidney, brain, lung, heart, and testis. So they were, apparently it takes some dead animals and they checked a number of different places for uh, sRNA. 67 could be assigned to known uh, microRNA families, which means that 33 could not. Uh, established patterns of microRNA expression were generally recapitulated in monotremes. They're a lot like other animals. To determine the conservation pattern of microRNAs in platypus, we identified platypus microRNA as sh sharing at least 16 nucleotide identity with microRNA in eutherian mammals, that is mouse and chicken and human, and chicken. Although most conserved microRNAs were identified across these vertebrate lineages, 137 microRNAs, 10 microRNAs were shared only with eutherian, that is mouse or human, and four only with chicken, and not with mouse or human. MicroRNAs can be classified into families based on identity of the functional seed region at position two to eight of the mature microRNA strand. Now, the uh, picture, I think, is even more interesting. This is the microRNAs that are in platypus only. This is in animals all across the spectrum. Platypus, mouse, human, and chicken. This is mouse and human, and this is platypus and chicken. So, um, here's another drawing of the same thing. In fact, I'm going to enlarge that so it's a little easier to see. You can see that most of the microRNAs are actually unique to the platypus. What that means is that not only is the platypus got genes from here and genes from there, it's got its own private genes, and they actually swamp all the other ones. There are more platypus-only uh, microRNA uh, than there are microRNA from other animals. It's got its own design. Here you can see it again, and this is the number of copies it's the log number of copies, so this means a thousand copies, and this means a million copies. These things happen over and over again. And here's platypus, mouse, human, and chicken, all the way across the spectrum. Here's the platypus and mammals. Here's the platypus and chicken. And, uh, and this is the platypus only. And you'll notice that a lot of these are unique to the testis. Apparently reproduction is a very difficult thing to do and requires a lot of instructions. So not only are we dealing with a hodgepodge of other genomes, but we're also dealing with unique stuff to the platypus. We identified microRNA families that were shared between platypus and eutherians, but not chicken, 40 families, or between platypus and chicken, but not eutherians, eight families, suggesting that for some microRNAs, only the seed region may have been selectively conserved. Conserved, are, well, that's one explanation, explanation. The other one is, of course, that it was designed that way. Um, Conserved microRNAs tended to be only more robustly expressed in the platypus tissues analyzed than in lineage-restricted microRNAs. To identify microRNAs unique to monotremes, we used a heuristic search that identifies microRNA candidates in deep sequencing data sets. So they've got a bunch of data sets and they went through them. This method produced 183 novel microRNAs in platypus and echidna. 
Oh, they're doing echidna too. Unfortunately, they don't. They didn't publish the echidna data they have. Um, notably, 92 of these lay in nine large clusters on platypus chromosomes X1, and that's the biggest X chromosome, and contigs. Uh, you can read the numbers. Physical mapping confirmed that at least five of these contigs are linked to the long arm of chromosome X1. These abundantly express, expressed clusters were sequenced almost exclusively from platypus and echidna testis. You notice most of them are in the testis. The expansion of this uh, unique microRNA class and its expression domain, expression domain suggests possible roles in monotreme reproductive biology. Well, you kind of expect that if they're found in the testis. Peewee acting RNAs, peewees are strange proteins that um, attach to RNA and uh, interfere with regular RNA uh, function. Associated with a germline expressed clade of argonaut proteins, known as peewees, and have a role in transposon silencing, silencing and genome methylation. So these are programming other parts of the genome to stop working. Monotreme PI RNAs bear strong structural similarities to those in eutherians, very much like regular animals. They are 29 nucleotides in length and arise from testis-specific genomic clusters with distinct genomic strand asymmetry, often with a typical bidirectional organization. So they take 29 nucleotides apiece, and they're organized, and they often uh, are organized in a way that, uh, that it apparently intera can interact with themselves. We identified 50 major platypus PIRNA clusters as well as numerous smaller clusters. In contrast to PIRNA in mouse, platypus PIRNA are repeat rich and bear strong signatures of active transposon defense. So these PIRNAs look like they're actually doing something. We set out to define the protein coding gene content of platypus to illuminate both the specific specific biology of the monotreme clade and for comparisons to eutherians and marsupials or to chicken, the representative sarpsid. Which again, it would be interesting to see uh, what happens to the tuatara or to, for that matter, to a lizard, monitor lizard, say. Protein coding genes were predicted using the established ensemble pipeline suitably modified for platypus, with a greater emphasis placed on similarity matches to mammalian genes. So they're looking for matches to mammalian genes. Overall, this results in 18,527 coding, protein coding genes being predicted from the current platypus assembly. The number of platypus protein coding genes is less similar to estimates for a human and a possum, possum being a kind of a standard marsupial. So, yeah, about the same as you have for other animals. We were interested in first in identifying platypus genes that contribute most to core biological functions that are conserved across mammals. These will be typically simple one-to-one -one orthologs, genes that have remained as single copies without duplication or deletion in platypus, in eutheria, specifically in dog, human, and mouse, and an opossum, a representative marsupial. Subsequently, we considered genes that have been duplicated or deleted in the monotreme lineage or that have been lost in eutherian or marsupial lineages. Such genes are proposed to contribute most to the lineage-specific biological functions that distinguish individual mammals. These studies required the reuse of an outgroup species, and they're using chicken as their outgroup. Chicken is not supposed to be that common. They're that related to the rest of it. 
As expected, the majority of the platypus genes, about 82%, have orthologs in these five other amniotes. In other words, the single copies of protein coding genes um, all kind of fit together. The remaining orphan genes are expected to primarily reflect rapidly evolving genes for which no other homologs are discernible. Wait a minute. 82% kind of fit with other mammals. That means that 18% are orphans. They're unique genes to the platypus. Well, how can that be? Well, they have to be so rapidly evolving that you can't tell what they used to be. Or erroneous predictions. Or they could be true lineage-specific genes that have been lost in each of the other five species under consideration. Or maybe they were designed specifically for the platypus. But, uh, of course, design's not a valid hypothesis. Um, simple one-to-one -one orthologs which have been conserved without duplication, deletion, or non-functionalization across the five mammalian species were greatly enriched in, ha in housekeeping functions such as metabolism, DNA replication, and mRNA splicing. In other words, the stuff that does the routine stuff is all there because all cells, whether you're a mammal, whatever, have to do metabolism. They have to get energy from food. They have to do DNA replication. They have to reproduce the DNA, and they have to do mRNA splicing. So all cells, whether from monotremes or from um, uh, dogs or humans or mice or whatever, have to have those functions. And so it's not surprising that those functions are done by similar, uh, similar enzymes, which have similar genes to produce them. But apparently there are some other ones that are totally unique to the platypus itself. Um, there's, this, there's a paragraph in Purifying Selection, which we'll kind of move over. Uh, next, we determine the genetic distance of echidna from the platypus. This gets interesting. The median DS value of 0.125 for the orthologs of echidna in platypus, when compared to the value for the monotreme lineage, predict that platypus and echidna last shared a common ancestor 21.2 million years ago. That is the molecular data. Although similar to previous estimates, and they have a res uh, reference for that, so this is, this is not just crazy data. This value seems to be at odds with fossil evidence, perhaps owing to relatively recent reductions of mutational rates in the monotreme lineage. Now, you, that perhaps owing to recently, uh, recent reductions of mutation rates is a guess. It's a hypothesis to explain the data. And it's interesting that they don't give you the data, but I went back and looked at the... Um, at the reference, and uh, the problem is that there's a platypus that's from the Cenozoic, which is 60 to 100, uh, 65 to 100 million years ago, more or less. So this was uh, 21.2 million years ago, according to the um, according to the genome, some five times that or four times that. Uh, according to the fossil evidence, at least if you accept the geologic time scale. So there's a problem there. Why do the echidna look and the um, platypus look so much similar when they separated much longer ago than that? Monotreme biology, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. And then we're getting to eggs. Fertilization in the platypus exhibits both sauropsid and therian characteristics. Sauropsid, of course, meaning chicken. 
Platypus oba are small, four millimeters diameter, relative to comparably sized reptiles and birds, and eggs hatch at an early stage of development so that most growth of the embryo and in infant is dependent on lactation, as in marsupials. Like all mammals and many other amniotes, when fertilization occurs, the ovum is invested with a zona pellucida. It has a, this kind of clear zone around it. The platypus genome encodes each of the four proteins of the human zona pellucida, as well as two ZPAX genes that previously were observed only in birds, amphibians, and fish. Did they get it from birds? Did they get it from amphibians? Did they get it from fish? They didn't get it from standard reptiles. Notice that? So here's some more of this kind of mosaic or uh, maybe I should call it an amalgamated uh, genome. The aspartyl protease non-thespian is present in platypus, but has been lost from marsupial and eutherian genomes. So non-thespian is present in platypus. Well, how do they know it's been lost? Well, because the marsupial and eutherian genomes must have had it because the common ancestor must have had it. So it's been lost. In zebrafish, this gene is, sufficiently, is specifically expressed in the liver of females under the action of estrogens. And you notice that they use the British spelling. This is nature. And accumulates in the ovary. These are the same characteristics as of the vitelligenins, that's egg proteins, indicating that nothespin may be involved in the processing vitelligenin or other egg yolk proteins. We find that the platypus has retained a single vitelligenin gene and pseudogene, whereas sauropsids such as chicken have three and the vi viviparous marsupials and eutherians have none. So here's something that's in the chicken, it's in the um, it's in the, in, the, uh, in the platypus, it's not in the rest of the animals. What I'd really like to know is, is it in the tuatara? Because if it's not, then it suggests that we have horizontal gene transfer. Or maybe um, assisted horizontal gene transfer. Spermatozoa, to skip down to the more interesting area, the most abundant secreted protein in the platypus epididymis is the lipocalcin, the homologs of which are most, the most secreted proteins in the reptilian epididymis. This is put out in a lot by um, the area around the testis. Uh, normally, Adam 7, a protease that is secreted in the epididymis of eutherians, has an ortholog in the platypus, no notably. This is a bona fide protease with a characteristic zinc coordinated sequence HE, histidine, uh, glutamic acid, another protein, another protein, and histidine in the platypus, in the opossum, and in the tree shear. So th there's something that's uh, similar to a number of different uh, mammals. However, loss of its proteolytic acti activity is predicted in eutherians owing to a single mut point mutation within its active site where uh, E, glutamine, uh, pardon me, glutamic acid, um, goes to Q. Which uh, let's see, glutamine. Uh, it must be aspartic acid. I'm sorry. It goes to um, goes to asparagine. Um, lactation and dentition, and when it analyzed phylogenetically and mapped the platypus genome assembly, these and it's been talking about uh, 19 venom sequences. Um, are revealed to have arisen from local duplications of genes possessing very different functions. Notably, duplications in each of the C, uh, the Fensen C-type 
natriuretic peptide and nerve growth factor gene families have also occurred independently in reptiles during the evolution of their venom. So the snakes that have venom and the platypus that has venom has very similar, this is called convergent evolution. Uh, convergent evolution has thus clearly occurred during the independent evolution of reptilian and monotreme venom. Because you can't blame this on a common ancestor. Otherwise, it would have had to have been lost in a whole bunch of different lineages. And that's just hard, too hard to believe. So, not only do they have proteins, uh, I mean, mRNAs, they actually have proteins that are similar to other animals that they're not directly related to. This is some more kind of hodgepodge kind of stuff. It's been picked out of one and put into another. Horizontal gene transfer, anyone. And uh, there's the immune system they discuss, the genomic landscape, and the platypus chromosomes, and then for the unique 5X chromosomes of platypus, we reveal considerable sequence alignment similarity to chicken Z and no orthologous gene alignments to human X, implying that the platypus X chromosome evolved directly from a bird-like ancestral reptilian system. It would be interesting to test that theory looking at the tuatara. Repeat elements. The platypus has a higher proportion of microsatellites with high A plus T content in comparison to other vertebrates examined, an abundance distribution that has more in common with reptiles than with mammals. So here it's looking at looking more like a reptile than a mammal. Genomic imprinting, the CPG faction, conclusions. We report here that sequence characteristics of the platypus genome show features of reptiles as well as mammals. And I might say as well uh, as of uh, birds because they're including birds as reptiles. The platypus has fully elaborated uh, piRNA and miRNA pathways, the latter including many monotreme-specific miRNAs, and miRNAs that are shared with either mammals or chickens, and of course, with both. Many functional assessments of these novel miRNAs remain to be carried out and will surely add to our knowledge of mammalian miRNA evolution. Of course, it would help if you understood function before you went that far, but the 18,527 protein coding genes predicted from the platypus assembly fall within the range for therian genomes, very similar to other mammals. Of particular interest are families of genes involved in biology that links monotremes to reptiles, such as egg laying, vision, and envenomation. Unfortunately, they didn't say too much about vision in the uh, uh, article otherwise as well as mammal-specific characters such as lactation, characters shared with marsupials such as antibacterial proteins, and platypus-specific characters such as venom delivery and underwater foraging. For instance, anatomical adaptations for chemoreception during underwater foraging are reflected in an unusually large repertoire of vomeronasal type 1 receptor genes. We didn't go over that specifically. However, the repertoire of milk protein genes is typically mammalian, and the arrangement of milk protein genes seems to have been preserved since the last common ancestor of monotremes and therian mammals. Since its initial description, the platypus has stood out as a species with a blend of reptilian and mammalian features, and again, as bird-like, of course, because the duck-billed platypus is um, uh, you know, has built very much like a duck, um, which is a characteristic that penetrates to the level of the genome sequence. In other words, it looks like it's put together by a committee. Its genome looks like it's been put together by a committee. The density and distribution of repetitive sequence, for example, reflects this fact. The high frequency of interspersed repeats in the platypus, platypus genome, although typical for mammalian genomes, is, con is in contrast with the observed mean microsatellite coverage, which appears more reptilian. 
<coughs> we find that the, that the mixture of reptilian, mammalian, and unique characteristics of the platypus genome provide many clues to the function and evolution of all mammalian genomes. Uh, exactly how you put those clues together is not clear. The, the wealth of new findings and confirmation of existing knowledge immediately evident from the release of these data promise that the availability of the platypus genome sequence will provide the critically needed background to inspire rapid advances in other investigations of mammalian biology and evolution. And that's the end of that, except for, of course, references and backup stuff and um, all kinds of extra details that you can find looking at. By the way, this is open to the public. You can look at it anytime you want to. Um, the, my take on this is that the platypus is a unique animal having features of multiple other animals. It is not surprising that its genome has elements derived from other animals such as mammals, birds, and reptiles, and apparently in one case amph amphibians. A designer could easily do this. This would actually be kind of fun if you were a designer. Evolution could have selectively preserved bird-like, mammal-like, placental, marsupial, and reptile-like DNA and characteristics. Uh, yeah. The branches are more complicated than, than that according to uh, standard evolutionary theory. It's pretty hard to see how you would actually do that. And remember, you have to keep the animal alive in the meantime. And somehow you have to keep the ancestors from being fossilized because otherwise you would see something gradually turning from a reptile into a, a monotreme along with doing that for mammals as well. It would be interesting to look at the relationship between the platypus, the bird, more than one species. And I'd especially like to see the duck since it does have a duck bill. And the tuatara, whose genome was partially sequenced in 2012. Um, it will be interesting because if the tuatara doesn't have all these bird-like uh, uh, sequences, and the monotreme and other birds and, and birds uh, do have it, then that implies that the dinosaurs didn't have it. Those are, would be the bird ancestors, in which case we're dealing with some more convergent evolution. It is also interesting to note that the echidna and platypus molecularly separated 16.5 million years ago, while there is a fossil platypus in the Cretaceous. The large number of platypus-specific microRNAs have similar, although less convincing, implications as orphan genes. Uh, less convincing because they're shorter, 29 bases instead of 300 bases, for example. Um, but still, there's so many of them, and they're all unique. All things considered, the platypus genome is more easily explained by a design hypothesis than by an unguided random hypothesis that somehow created this hodgepodge of stuff that actually works. It's almost as if the designer was having fun. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, we have a comment. Well, go ahead. You're What's a tuatara? Tuatara? Uh, that's a little lizard-like creature in New Zealand. But it's not exactly like a lizard. In, in structure of the bones and stuff, it's more like dinosaurs. And so that creature would show you as close as we can get to what dinosaur DNA is, unless and until we find a frozen Tyrannosaurus rex in the Arctic, in which case we can do the sequencing directly. Okay, help me understand. Where are the platypus indigenous to? Uh, they're indigenous to Australia. I think also Tasmania, at least from my reading. And is the fossil record any place else other than in that area? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that Cretaceous platypus, um, it just mentioned it and moved on and didn't say where. So I'm, be I'm interesting sure the, if uh, the information exists somewhere, but I have no clue yeah, as to where. It would be interesting if it was found in other areas of the globe other than just in the Australia area. I can tell you that kangaroos are found in Asia. 
Now, that isn't the same as a platypus, but... Still a marsupial, yeah. Pardon me? Kangaroos were found in Asia. Fossil kangaroos. So, um, those who say that they couldn't have come from the ark, well, they're not quite correct. Uh, at least, uh, you know, that's interesting because it suggests that uh, kangaroos are not solely indigenous to Australia and Wallace's line didn't cut them off from the rest of the world. Yes? Well, this just seems to me to make uh, poss any possibility of evolution even more distant and impossible. I mean, they kind of had a running go at it for a while when they said, well, uh, mutation and selection, which we now know doesn't work, it only produces uh, uh, strange results and now they have no mechanism that they can even come up with uh, this just makes it more difficult the only explanation is somebody had to design this yeah um, it's very interesting to see the reaction that you usually get to puzzles like this and somebody says well you know, couldn't somebody have designed this? The, the usual reaction is, but there was no designer, and so it had to just happen on its own. Yeah, there are more lost than everywhere. And that, that's an important point. Because what's, what's, what's happening is people are force-fitting the data into the theory because the theory has to be right because the alternative is unthinkable. I have a couple more questions. Can you go further into the venom and what the uh, actions of the venom are? And then also, what is the construction of the bill? Is it a keratin-type structure? Is it, uh, what, what is it, uh, uh, cartilaginous, or, or what is it? That is actually beyond my area of expertise. I would, okay. I would guess that it is somewhat similar to a bird's Maybe bill. Dr. Roth knows? Pardon me? Maybe Dr. Roth knows? Uh, no. <laughs> looked in that, sorry. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, once you get educated enough, uh, really educated enough, you start realizing the limits of your own knowledge, and sometimes the limits of human knowledge in general. If it's a vegetarian, why would it need venom, venom is what I guess my question is. Uh, that's interesting because it's not, it's not technically a vegetarian. It's more like an insectivore kind of thing. I mean, but... But it doesn't kill its insect prey with uh, with venom, and then eat them. It you know, it gloms onto them with its bill, which apparently has electric sensors there, uh, and uh, can detect very small electrical fields. And apparently that's how it is able to you know swim underwater, closing its eyes, closing its ears, closing its nose, and and still find stuff. Uh, it doesn't have to rely just simply on touch. And uh, so it has electrical uh, sensors there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know what the bill is made of. Is it near extinction? Is it, uh, is it a very it's endangered species? It's sort of on the edge of endangered species. It's not, it's not a really um, it's not majorly extinct, uh, you know, in danger like the California condor or something. But, but it is, um, uh, it is. I think it's in the 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 least dangerous class of of, uh, of endangered species. Does it make a good pet? It looks kind of cute. I you <laughs> that that I don't know. Yeah, you were asking about the, the, apparently venom is not used to kill its, its prey. It's more used to um, uh, warn other animals not to mess with it. It seems to me that uh, you've got so many changes involved here that the rarity of this in the fossil record uh, 
kind of rules out evolution just from that particular standpoint. I mean, uh, you for all those changes, you should have a tremendous record there. Well, one of the problems is that when you, all you have is bones left, it's very difficult to figure out what the critter was like. You know, I mean, uh, you know, obviously, if the bones are, you know, three feet long, you're going to say that the critter was probably three to three and a half feet long or something like that, um, depending on how many bones you have. But, um, but bones won't show you when the venom developed, if at all. Bones won't show you... Uh, the thing that's striking to me is that it's fl uh, the article that I read flat out said it was a platypus that they found in the Cretaceous. It didn't say a platypus-like object or an <laughs> early platypus or a um, platypus that looked more generalized than, than the usual or something like that, just platypus. Maybe. So apparently, you know, you really couldn't tell significant differences between it and the ones we have now. But if you're looking for a common ancestor for, for all these things, it's somewhere here. I mean, it, it is. Uh, we got it. We got, we got missing links here. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a huge problem. And I, I mean, you know, for cladism, you can just uh, whatever the ancestor was, and you just kind of you let you leave it open to total imagination, or you can leave and leave it to design. Well, let's see. This one will have milk on. These three will have milk on. Um, and then, you know, go from there. Uh, that's, actually, that's actually design characteristics that they're, that they're talking about. Um, but in order to keep the animal alive, you have to have a creature that has, uh, is, uh, you know, milk production. It's not enough to have just abstract milk production. I mean, that's basically, that would be the Linnaean classification, not, the, uh, not an evolutionary story. Because an evolutionary story has to start out with animals or, or uh, the creatures that gradually turn, I suppose, from fish to amphibians to reptiles to birds and mammals, depending on which way you, you went, with leaving some reptiles and amphibians and fish behind. Um, and it's pretty obvious that fish existed, um, but you need, you know, you need quarter fish, three quarters amphibians, or three quarters fish, quarter amphibians, and so forth. Um, and they could branch in any number of different directions, but you need at least one lineage that goes, you know, parent daughter, or parent son, parent child, parent child, parent child, all the way down. And we just don't find, uh, we don't find those kinds of transitions. And, and unfortunately, with the fossil record, you can't look at it and say, oh, and this one is this big and it had, it had venom glands by now. Because unless the venom glands are hollowed out into the bone, you'll never know. They're not suggesting any horizontal transfer, or gene transfer here. It's all common ancestor, right? Well, I'm suggesting, I mean, if you were going to ask me, I think yeah. the designer did horizontal gene transfer. Yeah, fine. I, he agree. Took, I agree. He took gene from this, uh, you know, from the duck sure. and put it in and got the duck's bill. And Why not? Uh, but uh, the evolutionary interpretation is common ancestor, not horizontal gene transfer. Yeah, well... You have you have two problems, okay? One of them is that you have you have some things that look like they're diverged, so they diverged, okay? You can kind of sort of see that. Then, uh, although uh, Dirt and Schmidt gives you a time frame for that that's really too long. Um, then you have the you have some of them that that. are the same in two different lineages, but a lot of the other ones have lost them. 
Now, did they lose them or did they appear in those two lineages? Unless we have the ancestors, you don't really know. And of course, if it's horizontal gene transfer, there never would have been ancestors that had those genes. Uh, and you know, finally, you get the absolutely incredible convergent evolution. Uh, things like rice and uh, bacteria having the same opsin in them. And you just, you know, did they steal it from the bacteria? Did the bacteria steal it from them? There, it's obviously not in the common ancestors for way back when. And there you're looking at something that looks like it's just unbelievable that convergent evolution would do that. Of course, that's true for a lot of convergent evolution. Um, and so in that case, it's easier to say, well, somehow the bacterial rhodopsin moved into the rice plant. Or maybe it was vice versa. Well, it's probably, probably bacteria to rice because there are too many bacteria that have it. Of course, with a designer, we get horizontal gene transfer all the time. There are human genes and there are modified human genes in yeast today. The yeast is kept in big vats and we harvest insulin and TPA and uh, retivase and all kinds of stuff like that from those genes that we put in there. We have transferred the blue coloration from another flower into the rose by putting in a gene and then by amplifying it later on so that we have created blue roses. That is horizontal gene transfer. That's, if you want to call it that, assisted horizontal gene transfer. And horizontal gene transfer happens all the time if designers have the, cap uh, have the requisite intelligence and capability. All they have to do is decide that's what they want. I can imagine, I can imagine humans doing this. I can imagine the devil doing this. I can imagine God doing this. I can imagine God saying, you know, I'd like to have an animal that has characteristics of this and that and the other. Let's see if we can put one together. And so he does. Uh, <laughs> but you, you can start transferring genes. It's not that easy for them to successfully. I mean, uh, you have so many things that are integrated in, in uh, getting an organ to work in the body. It's not just transferring the genes for that thing. You've got to transfer it in a system that uh, allows for the thing to function also. Well, like I say, there are some things that can be transferred fairly easily. Blue roses are one example. Um, there are some things that are a little more difficult to transfer. We haven't been able to put horns for a horse. I'm sure that there's a market for that. Doesn't Ellen Especially White single horns. That would, be, that would be really neat. Doesn't Ellen White talk about the amalgamation in the, that the antediluvians were doing? Uh, part of uh, the it does. And it makes you Wouldn't wonder. Wouldn't that be that, that type of horizontal? It, uh, it, it makes you wonder whether some of those creatures were, in fact, uh, uh, <coughs> creatures of genetic engineering, if you please. And then I have a, another question about the orphan genes. Were they, are they like vestigial or were they actually required then for the multiplication or for the reproduction process? The, are they the very necessary? The, the orphan RNA, is it, oh. is it a required thing for reproduction or is it vestigial? That's what my question is. Okay, it's a good question. I don't know that anybody knows the answer right now. In order to a answer that question, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go through and you'd have to take out a section of those genes from the monotreme genome, Correct. from the platypus genome, and see if the creature could survive without them. And so the answer is nobody really knows yet. Uh, 
the fact that there are so many of them kind of makes you think that maybe they would be necessary. Um, but who knows? Thank you. And, you know, as far as that goes, orphan genes, I, I think, are the death knell of evolution because you try to imagine, well, we've got to keep the same of this and the same of this and the same of this, but now we'll create a totally new protein. Does anybody have any idea how long it takes or how many steps it takes to produce a protein? You know, you have to go from a nondescript sequence of DNA to a, a sequence of DNA that has very precise amounts of amino acids in certain areas, and then whatever introns that have to be put there as well. And, uh, oh, let's say you have a uh, 100 amino acid protein, which is a small protein. That's 300 bases that you've got to order. Um, and let's supposing that only half of those are needed, which uh, we find out in the case of histones, it's probably an exaggeration, but maybe there's some that can do that. So that means that you only have to actually have 50 of them uh, or, or 150 bases in order. And you start out with a random sequence and you want to go towards a particular sequence that you want. Um, you know, the chances of doing that are uh, 4 to the 150th power, which is a very large number. It's 2 to the 300th or about, if I m my memory serves me correctly, um, let's see, 4 to the 50 power is roughly uh, 0.6 <coughs> times 150 would be 1... 90, about 10 to the 90th, which is more than there are particles in the universe. Mm -hmm. So the, the chances of that happening just by random mutation are incredibly low. But if you're going to do it by gradual evolution, as evolution requires to be, you need some survival value all along the way. All along the way. This Each step has to be useful if you're going to have it done in any kind of time. Because just to get two mutations in a creature like a human takes, according to the math, 100, years, or 100 million years. And we only have 6 million years to do it. Well, maybe 12 million if you count going both ways. Amazing thing about all this is that you actually need to know beforehand how not only to construct all this, but you have to know what you're going for. Uh, you want to make a creature, you have to have this concept in your mind, and what a mind would take, we can't even imagine. And then you know, you know what you want, and you know how to do it. And we just can't think in those well, uh, lines. We're not near it. Yeah. Well, that's the whole question. Can this be done by a system that only allows you to mutate and then test it and see if it works? Yeah. And that's all. You you got to know what works before you try and all this stuff or if, it will never work. Yeah. If you know where you're heading, you can test for, is it getting closer? If you don't know where you're heading... Well, I think this thing goes further. Just wander around forever. Uh, you, yeah. You, uh, you have to know where you're going. To get there, but evolution does not know where it's going. No, well, that's it's that, random. That is exactly the point, and that's one reason why people are starting to say that Darwinian evolution doesn't have all the answers, and we need to rethink uh, how we're looking at evolution. And they're not willing to come over to the side that says there was a designer yet, but they're starting to say, well, maybe uh, uh, genomes can do a little bit of design of themselves. And then the, the real question then comes, well, where did that original ability to design itself come from? And uh, you're right back to, uh, you know, you can get by with evolution maybe, but you can't get by with the origin of life. Right. For that, you need 10 to the minimum 
of 10 to the uh, 1,018 universes. That's the literature, Kunin. Oh, I mean, once once you once you really look at it, it's more like ten to the millionth universe, uh, ten to the million universes. Uh, Thousand eighteen is a gross underestimate, but whatever. As new anyway. incomprehensibility to the incomprehensible. Next week we'll have something on miracles. I don't know exactly what it's going to be because I'm still looking at the material, but. Uh, uh, we'll see you guys next.